Uh, today we are going to look at uh, one more uh, project within time series module known as Walmart sales prediction with profit and light GBM. So this particular uh, data set is from a Kaggle competition known as M5 forecasting and you can see the description of that particular competition as shown in this page. Uh, you can look at uh, the more details are given in another uh, link from this one, which is not, which is shown here, myfc.unaiset. If you download the guidelines here, you you can see the description of the data up for this competition uh, in more detail. So what you see here is uh, I sales of items in from Walmart stores and. Uh, the, across many years and uh, details can be seen within this hierarchy how the structure of the data is so you can see that there are three states California Texas and uh, Wisconsin and uh, within that California state there are four stores within Texas there are three stores within Wisconsin there are three stores and within each of those stores there are three categories hobbies, foods, and household items. And within each of those categories, you have two departments, hobby one, hobby two, food one, food two, food three, household one, household two, and there are many items, each of those departments. So in total, they make up about three and 49, because there are 12, so breakdown of this particular data set by different uh, uh, hierarchy is is provided in this document. Like if you, you there are three states, so you know if you break down by state, you have three parts. If you break down by stores, you have ten parts. If you break down by category, you have three parts, and so on. So this is a hierarchical time series data, uh, but our goal is to produce. Uh, uh, predictions or forecast for these 42,840 items uh, which are spread across 10 stores and every product right so the, the way this data is different from previous projects is there are many time series within this particular data. there are uh, exactly 42,840 time series and we are trying to come up with a way to project this. How do we approach this problem? Now, why? Uh, so when I was looking for projects, the reason why I picked this particular project is because it poses some practical problems in terms of implementation. So first, the data set is large and you have a large number of time series and uh, you have historically they, they provided data for about um, five years it's it the data spreads from five years and it's a daily data so there will be missing data there will be data where there are no sales zero sales for certain items so um, unlike uh, the energy data or airline data there are days where there are no pr um, items and this is also a practical problem so let's look at what is given to us within this data set uh, from Kaggle uh, so if you look at the data, so they gave us the uh, five files. There is this calendar file, which essentially provides us the date where they start providing us data from 2011-01-29 all the way to 2016. Um, and then this is the day it starts and the week day, whether it's a Saturday, Sunday and, um, and also the month and year. Then you have uh, sales train evaluation. This is where you have the ID of an item, the item um, that belongs to store. So that this is an item ID, but this is actual ID of a specific item that is in a specific store, which is in a specific state, right? So this is the ID of the row, and then this is the item ID, this is the department ID, category ID, and store ID and uh, these are the number of sales that happened during day one which is uh, you, you can see which is from 2011 
the day and then all the way to day um, I think 1941 or 1931 in this particular data set so this will be in 2016 so the number of days between these two okay uh, after, let's look at um, how we approach this data uh, so as usual I set up um, various directories as well as import uh, required pandas there are other packages that are needed and which are provided later in the notebook so these are the files that i downloaded from kaggle which is uh, sales prices sample submission sales trains data and evaluation yeah one thing that i did not use here is sales train evaluation which is pretty much similar to sales train validation except that it has additional 28 days data so this has uh, labeling data that can be used to do your validation uh, which is used to compute the public leaderboard score so so that's a sales train evaluation so you can the last 28 days is what we are trying to predict last 28 days the forecast sales forecast of all the items and this calendar cv essentially date and the important event that comes with this date so let's look at uh, the sizes of the data and uh, why this particular data is difficult. So I wrote, um, so you, you know, these are the data frames and I, I wrote a function which is somewhat convenient display uh, data frame. And what it, what it does is essentially it shows number of rows within that data frame and number of columns. Like as you see here, it also shows a, a snippet of it, the header and also how much memory it takes um, and what are the data types as well so this gives a complete description of the data frame so essentially three things that i print a number of rows columns and what, what it has as well as the data type and the memory it takes again i, I did the same thing for sales train evaluation sales train validation and calendar at csv so this submission file is a, a format where uh, that, that specifies what format the file is prepared so that you can submit for the Kaggle competition. So one thing, one of the things that we, we noticed is that this particular data set, for example, is um, half gig and uh, uh, another, data, another half gig uh, and so on. So this is pretty big data set. Um, so when you are trying to add new features, when you're trying to do um, various pandas operations this half gig can become 20 gigs 30 gigs and so on depending on what you're doing with the data set and if you're maintaining multiple copies of it it becomes intractable to manage it so the first thing that one can do is to reduce uh, the memory usage of any data frame this is a utility function if you um have used if you are in participated in e-kaggle competitions um there are some competitions with the data sets which are larger. So this particular, and I have noticed that often they use this particular methodology to reduce the data frame size. Um, so what it does is it goes through each of the elements and see what is the minimum and maximum and try to decide uh, what data type is suitable. So by default, if you look at uh, any of the files, it will show object, object, and uh, integer 64 and report 64. But, but this one, even in the 64, it actually consumes a lot more memory. Probably, if you want to specify, you know, something like a weekday, integer 8 is good enough. One byte is good enough. Why use, uh, you know, four bytes or, in, in this case, eight bytes. Right? So this is what it does. This particular function can be useful when dealing with the large data sets. So I'm not going to go in detail. You can pause and look at uh, what is given here. Um, but uh, so the first step I did is to take all of these data frames that I just read and shrink it down uh, using this method. Method. Uh, so in this case, you know, this reduced uh, from 208 megabytes to 130 megabytes. And this one, it's almost like you know, five times reduction. So from 452 megabytes to 96 and 446 to 95 and so on. So, so when you look at, uh, let's look at some of the, we did not, let's look at the data 
that we are handling here. So you have your given ID, item ID, department ID, category ID, and so, uh, store ID, along with the sales that are happening from day one to day 1941. So this is a, a data evaluation data set. So we have, um, these are the dates, but what we want to do is we want to, uh, this is in a wide format. We want to create into a long format so that we see like a series, time series data set where you have day one, day two, day three, um, and so on in individual rows. That way it's easy to, uh, easy to perceive what's happening within the data frame and what are the additional variables. For example, if you want to add um, date feature engineering variables, then we can easily add uh, if they are in rows rather than in, in, in the columns. So we will create a data set where we combine uh, this, this main data set to a calendar data set uh, let's look at the so the calendar data set has uh, all of these features it provides date weekday week month and there are other event types whether it's a super bowl or you know what kind of uh, holiday whether it's a holiday or not and so on um, there are additional variables which we will not be using because it will take a long time for me to explain and to feature engineering but i will uh, use what is the what are the most important features from this particular data set and uh, there is also uh, sale price uh, which um, the first uh, data set so sale price is for this particular item id the cost of the item id is 9.5 dollars i think you can also use it to do some feature engineering or improve your forecast accuracy uh, so you can combine all of this one so this is exactly what I did. Um, so the first step is to melt. The data melt is essentially converting the wide format into a long format where I'm giving that data frame and I'm, I'm saying that these are all the fields that I need in each row. And then I, I am uh, um, uh, creating a long format for the day variable, uh, which is a day. And then the sales is the value that is there. And if there are any nulls, I'm dropping them off. And then uh, once this data frame is created, I'm merging a calendar uh, based on the day. And then also, if, if at all, if I'm including events, now, or depending on if I'm including my events or not, not events, I can add events to the data frame. And in, in case I don't run with the event, then the data frame three is I'm just picking these variables without events and, and, and so on. Finally, I merged uh, the sales price to the data frame. So one of the things that happens when you're dealing with large data sets is whenever you rerun, you have to reload all of these data sets. And if there are, let's say in this case, I want to try by including events and sometimes I want to try without including events and sometimes I want to read evaluation data set sometimes I want to read validation data set so each time you're reading and doing operations it's taking a lot of memory and it, it, it's taking a lot of time it will take a lot of time so in order to save effort when you're dealing with large data set any project that has large data set you have to use um, a pickle uh, function to be able to write um, these big objects that you read uh, into the disk so that when you load it, it you load it quickly and you're ready to go to do any analysis or uh, uh, to, to do any analytics so the the first thing that i did was uh, okay i have a i'm creating a pickle file for my validation data set so remember the validation data set is is uh, is this is the validation data set or actually this is the validation data set so this data set after combining with events as well as with sell price that particular which i'm calling validation data set e i'm saving it in into um local disk so if i'm saying if the pickle file already exists then uh, i'm just loading the data file which will be useful when you're rerunning the data otherwise i'm saving it uh, by using pickle.dump, right? 
so it returns so i'm creating various formats of this validation data set one using um, whether or not i'm including events data set so in this case i'm including events data set in this case i'm not and these are a validation data set and evaluation data set so both of them i'm saving this so there are essentially four files which i'm reading i'm doing some processing on the the merging with calendar and events and then saving back as an object that can be loaded directly into the uh, notebook uh, with a short amount of time so i'm also using gc.collect which is uh, um useful if there are any objects that are lying around that are consuming space when you call this uh, garbage collector it will um, remove this uh, these items from ram and make space available for running this uh, notebook so another useful uh, so when you are given this data test one way of looking at it is the way we looked at uh, the header for example here this is how one we looked at how the data data is given to us but another way to summarize to look at the data in a uh, in a summary way is to create a summary data set so i'll let me show you the output of this particular function you can use your own projects uh, what i'm showing here is that the validation data set has all of these columns id item id department id this is essentially a transpose of the columns you have store id state id day sales date and so on each of the data types you can see these are all objects because categorical data and then um, how much data is missing the sale price i think there's a lot 21 percent missing data set and the number of unique values so you can see the id wise uh, item id you have 3049 and there are 10 stores so you, you you know you can see the number of ids that you have in each of the stores and then you have a date object as well so you are looking at 1913 in the validation data set in the evaluation data set you are looking at 1941 so these are examples of uh, values so item id looks something which has store id state id and whether it's validation or evaluation as well as the item id it's a combination of those things and you can see various things so this is the date and this is a, a number that represents a, a week in a year okay so uh, if you want to look at uh, uh, try to understand the data so a little bit more you can group by by state and look at which state is doing more sales for example um, you can look at by store which store is going, doing uh, better sales and which is the which has the minimum sales and so on department you can look at which of the categories are doing how and so on right so and another way usually you can look at the same tables if you are a, a visual person you can look at it as a, a graph as shown here and then the next one is uh, uh, category state as well as the uh, categories by state you can look at the sales that are happening within this uh, data set so because we are we are looking at a time series data now just let's look at a time series so there are uh, 3049 items items but um, these are items across all stores but if you are looking at a one particular store and item there are uh, many many so you can imagine the number of series so when we look at one of the series for one of the id you can see the sales of this particular item looks like uh, this item was not available until 2013 but then the sales of this item are shown uh, on each day here if you want to zoom in a little bit more you can um, write for example here i'm looking from 2016 march to 2016 april and then then the next one is profit model um, so let's uh, once we under, since we understood the data set we are going to try to run a profit model a very basic profit model um, in this one what is involved in trying to do the forecasting for this kind of data set that there are um, many items and each of them have a, a series data so one 
simpler way or e the first uh, notion of solving this problem is to, okay let's take each id and try to do forecast so that's exactly what e is done using this profit model so here i'm looking at uh, hobbies and I'm, I'm writing a profit prediction function where i am getting the value for each uh, for this id this is the data set actually that we are trying to get what is shown in this graph and then you're uh, you're giving all of the parameters i did not give a thorough evaluation of what parameters are appropriate for this data set but i just give the defaults which is a daily seasonality is true weekly seasonality is true and yearly seasonality is true and then try to fit them and then generate forecast for next 28 days and uh, so this um, forecast usually uh, these predictions uh, are generated from profit in the format of ds y hat and uh, y hat lower y hat upper and there are many other um values that you can look into but what's interested the forecast itself is in my hat so i copied from into this data frame and then uh, finally uh, i am extracting three values one is date one is sales and then the id from uh, from uh, as the columns and then um, i'm returning the prediction prediction item so for every item that i i, I have in this case, I'm extracting all of the IDs, unique IDs. There are 30,490 IDs. So that's how many uh, CDs I have. So I have to run this program, 30,490 items. So this is where, in this case, you can see, I'm extracting only 10, I 10 items and I'm running profit through it. But if I were to run all of the 30,000 items on a single thread, it will take about 42 hours which is a pretty long time so but for demonstration purposes here I, I ran 10 iterations and you can see for some reason I use DQDM which should show this bar progress bar but there is an output that is generated from profit which some reason I couldn't silence it and uh, it looks like they use uh, a pice Stan, it's a uh, probability and statistical computation language, and uh, that actually generates this output. And for some reason, they could not silence this output. So that output is coming from here. So if you are using TQDM, which is the progress bar of the performance, uh, it shows awkward. It's not very clean. So that's exactly what's happening here. But after ten runs, you can see. Um, uh, it, it does take a quite a bit of time as i said uh, it to run this whole 30,000 it will take more than 42 hours um, so that's a quite a bit of time so i did not run all of them so that's not a feasible way of uh, approaching um, to solve this problem of course i mean if it generates good accuracy um, then by all means that's also a good way of computing if you have compute time uh, another way of doing it is probably use uh, multi-thread applications such as Dask or um, you can use uh, uh, I think other means of uh, you can have separate threads computing separate uh, IDs and then or you can have one thread for each store and you can run IDs that way as well that way you can reduce the amount of time that it, it takes um, Again, after combining all of the predictions, what you see is uh, the date and then the ID and the sales. So you can, once you have the data, you can use pivot function where I'm saying, um, so ID is my row and then the column is, is date and then the value is the sale. So once you have it, you can um, project the data set in, in this wide format, which is actually the submission format. So in order to have the same columns as in the submission column, so I created a column frame which looks in this way. And then finally the evaluation, the evaluation data set actually has 
the same uh, information which is used to do the evaluation for public leaderboard submission. So anyway, the data set that you are generating here is also in the evaluation. So you can compare the output generated from this prediction to this particular evaluation data set to know how well you're doing. So this is evaluation data set and this is the data set that you have produced from the predictions and it's identical. So you can definitely do the uh, comparison between the results that are generated here versus the generator that you're forecasting for the next 24, uh, next 28 days. So the next 28 days information is from here. Essentially all of these uh, from here to 28 days back is what you're projecting here. Right. Okay, so that method is essentially is feasible, but it requires a lot of uh, computation, one. And number two, it misses information. Like let's say if there is some information hidden among the DOS or among the stores, common across the stores or common across the departments or common across the categories, then that information is somehow not passed on. Uh, to the model so because it's only evaluating one series at a time so light gm gbm which is a, a tree model which does a decent job uh, in capturing information from other sources based on the calendar um, the date um, as well as any events that are happening in other departments for that same categories and so so on so light gbm model is is ideal for these kind of problems and also it is computationally faster than uh, the profit uh, computing mini series data so in this but however like gbm to set up a time series data you need to work with two important variables one is lags and the other one is information on windows so lag is essentially let's say you have data set here you're going back like lag of one means these particular days lag of 20 like in this case let's see lag of 10 you're going all the way here and trying to capture uh, this particular data lag of this value is you're going so this one essentially i'm looking at lag of 28 days to 34 days i mean you don't need these but uh, just to be cautious and having more variables i'm adding 28, 29, 30. So what I'm doing is I'm using information from 28 days ago to do the forecast today. For every, uh, that will be another variable because I don't have information on the 28, I'm going back all the way where my data is available. Let's say if they asked me to do forecast for 50 days, probably I'll, I'll look at the lag of 50 days and then get that information and try to do forecast based on that. So adding lags is one of the information one of the ways you generate the data. And another one is adding rolling mean based on. So what this one is saying is that, okay, let's say rolling mean of four days. So I'll go, so let's say this is the end of it. I'll go lag one, lag two, lag three, lag four. So I'll take this one and then four days from here, 1937, 1936, 35, 34, I'll compute the average sales of this particular item and create that window value. That's a rolling mean that I'm computing here. It's a basic, so if you're doing uh, uh, autocorrelation, uh, this is essentially that it's looking at the correlation of 28 days back uh, sales. And then this is doing the same thing, but it's actually doing 28 days to 25 days and averaging it or whatever days you are providing it. This is the width of the window. And this is the how many days back you are going going here. So you're looking at a day lag and how many days you're looking at from that day and capturing the mean of sales for that duration. Then you are adding time variables. This is a you know classic feature engineering. If you have a date variable, day of the week, day of the year, week of the year, month, year, quarter, and so on. So finally, when you add so um, all of these, um, actually, uh, all of these, you will get a data set. So which, so these, these are the three things. And another thing that we need to do is to uh, create a categorical variable. So for example, if if we know what are the categorical features, we are trying to label encode for light GBM. So we are using label encoder. 
so which is essentially taking all of these store ids and days sales category id item id department and converting into integer format so that it's easier to manage um, for these light jbm models so one thing that you might be wondering okay label encoder i have three states california texas and wisconsin why you know i can do use one hot encoding yes that is true we can use one cut encoding um where there are manageable number of uh, categories within that variable however um light gbm specifically says that in the documentation says that it can handle integers uh, when when these variables are coded as integers it can light gbm can handle as well as uh, one hot encoding so you don't lose anything by using a label encoder in fact they recommend using label encoder uh, for all of the categorical variable the only caveat is that we have to specify which are all the categorical variable which is something that we did in the model uh, so once i have i'm saving it as a pickle file again the data set that is processed so that we don't have to load and reload every time and once i save it i know anything that's out there in the ram is being deleted by calling gc.collect so you can see once we created we we created so many variables so here these are all the date variables and we have a uh, mean from particular lag rolling means r mean is rolling mean and then we have lag 34 to lag 29 and so on okay so these are all the columns that you have you have lag, lag 28 lag 29 lag 30 lag 31 32 33 and rolling mean and so on so here you again I have categorical uh, features and these are the event features. So in case in this case I just wanted to have an option of choosing events and not choosing events. So if uh, I include event, then I'm just adding categorical features to event. One thing that you will realize is that events are actually not a value. There is no value for many days of the events so th these events only happen on certain days of the year so the remaining times it's all empty so if you are doing label encoding make sure that these all of these events are actually coded as uh, uh, some unknown value give some name to it that will be, it will be considered as a separate category and encoding will be much faster so again, once uh, this is where I'm creating the data, data frame to run a light GBA model. Here I'm creating um, a cutoff value so that I can create a train and validation. So when I'm actually doing creating a forecast, uh, I don't have to do this one. I can use the complete data set, but I need to append uh, date, uh, data from valuation evaluation append to it and then try to do forecast on it um, if it's not clear it will be clear uh, within a few minutes um, so what let, let's look at what we are doing here so i'm here i'm creating a validation data set and i'm creating cutoff and uh, training data set validation data set uh, and then i'm creating sales here um, uh, uh, this is a way to convert a, a into training and validation data set. Uh, one more thing, this is a by train and by valid, which is uh, the labels that we have for each of the type for our light GBM data set. So I gave uh, these parameters, so which is very similar to most uh, XGB models. One thing that's uh, not so trivial is a uh, 3D distribution. So when you have uh, zero values for sales and which is true for uh, most of these values uh, there are no sales for certain items uh, across many days so the mass around zero is larger and for those i think using a 3d distribution or poisson distribution is a mm, ideal so in this case i'm using 3d uh, if you don't give any objective function it will take as a regression and then probably run a gaussian uh, it will assume that it's a Gaussian distribution and run through it. So in this case, uh, uh, once the model is uh, computed, I'm, I'm dumping uh, uh, 
into local file so that if I run this uh, notebook again, instead of running this model, I can just uh, load it from uh, what is there already. So here you can see that uh, RMSC value is 2.12, which is quite decent. And then uh, I'm saving this model and also computing RMSC. So if you're not sure how this uh, RMSC is computed, so here I'm getting predictions on the validation data set. So validation data set, again, we computed this one as using uh, uh, this cutoff and we are dropping the columns at the date so that we are exactly creating the data set that went into the model. So we created this uh, validation data set and here we are computing RMSC based on mean squared error uh, but using these sales and also predictions. So this is a true value and these are the predictions. And when, when I use the uh, option squared is equal to false, it will compute RMZ. Otherwise it will compute uh, mean squared error. So once you create this, uh, these are uh, essentially steps you are taking the validation data set, which looks more or less uh, like uh, our input data set um, that we used but we are doing a forecast. So for the forecast, I am getting the predictions, adding a forecast column to this particular data set, and then I am creating a wide format. So once you create the wide format, this is how the data sets looks like. And this is exactly what the submission file uh, wants you to compute. So there are many questions. So this project is, you know, it's already uh, probably more than 20 minutes to go through this video. Uh, but in this kind of projects, what you notice is that there are a lot more steps that I can do, and which will take maybe an hour more. But something that I need to stress is, uh, you can definitely do more feature engineering. It's a product that you're handling and you want to get predictions. If you want to improve prediction accuracy, you can definitely do more feature engineering. You can delve into what are the events and uh, you can add um, neighboring days of that event. If there is Super Bowl, maybe people are taking off uh, the day before and day after um, and so on. If And you can definitely do tuning for this LGB model, which I did not do. I took the defaults. You can add more regressive variables to profit model. You can parallelize runs, maybe using the Kubernetes task or using multi-thread approach. Um, also for generating future data, you have to use, um, you have to be very careful about encoding. So we used a label encoding and the label encoding should be consistent with the trading data set as well as the validation data set. Otherwise, um, if you encode, it might actually encode uh, a different uh, numerical variable and it might the model might interpret that particular item, for example, or a category differently from when it was trained. So make sure that the label encoding is consistent from training to the prediction data set. Um, so you can use pipelines to do this um, encoding and uh, missing value replacements and, and so on so that whenever you are, um, that it's a good practice to, to, to do to use SQL and pipelines, which I did not use in this case. Uh, so I think it, there are a few more things that I might have missed, but uh, these are all good practices to remember. Uh, and also there are uh, additional details about how to compute uh, RMSC and weighted RMSC for this kind of series where there are you know thousands of series. So how do you evaluate when you have those many number of uh, series is provided in this WMRSC, which is part of the competition. They explain how how you can weight each of the series when you're computing a hierarchical data series. So I think which is this is elaborate. So I without going much, I just want to uh, encapsulate what we went through today. Um, so we we looked at um, a Walmart sales predictions, and there are multiple data sets. We have we have seen how the data set this is this is provide the description of the data is provided here um, and we and the hierarchy of this particular data set uh, Walmart sales data and then we um, we looked at uh, where we got the data and how to download it which is essentially going to this calculator and then download these particular uh, files and then we set up we looked at how to set up the data. Uh, uh, our project modules 
and then we loaded the data. We tried to reduce the memory of the, each of the data because these are big data sets and uh, handling will become difficult if you don't manage your data types properly. And here we did a uh, merging of all the data required data sets and we save it as a pickle file. And then finally we, we, we looked at the data in a transpose manner so it, so that we can we have an idea about how many missing data, how many uniques are there and how each of the value of the data uh, column looks like and so on. And then we plotted uh, some, some of the categories to gain understanding about how sales are. Then um, we plotted one of the series for an ID. And you can also, we, we notice that there are missing sales value. You know, whenever you see the zeros here, these are all the days where they are, they are missing. So the difference between other data sets and this data set is that it has a lot, lot of missing data values. We ran a profit model, um, but in this case, I only ran about 10 of them. If I were to run all of them, it will take about 42 hours or even more. And then finally, I created the data set by transposing uh, pivoting into a submission format. Um, and then I looked at light GBM model where we added lag data as features, which is serving similar to autocorrelation uh, variables. And it, uh, we also added rolling mean, which also does the similar purpose, but has more value uh, or more or less similar value, I guess. Um, and here we added time variables, so what type of day it is, what type of, you know, whether it's a, this, uh, which quarter it is, which month it is, and so on. And also added some, uh, we did label encoding using label encoder for all of the categories. And then um, we ran a uh, light GBM model, let's see. Light GBM model, one thing that to remember when you are label encoding is to make sure that you mention categorical features. So finally, we saved into um, submission format and we noticed that we got a prediction accuracy of 2.12. And, uh, and there are additional steps that I did not uh, cover in this notebook and uh, it's good practices to do uh, use these uh, in your future projects. With that, I uh, conclude uh, this project.